Hello anatomy and physiology students. This is um, a first in a couple lectures on muscles. Now I know you can't see me. Um, my computer as it turns out messed up and uh, I gave it to a friend and hopefully he can get that fixed for me. This is my backup computer and it doesn't have a camera. So you're just going to be able to listen to me. I'm going to use the PowerPoint that we usually use in class. So it's more of an outline. So what I want you to do is to have your notebook out, piece of paper, some paper, and take notes. So you can, what, I, and what I'm envisioning is that you're going to watch this PowerPoint, kind of like being in class, and you're just going to take notes on what I'm going to say. And we're going to use this PowerPoint as our guide, as your outline, just like we would in class. You're just not going to be able to see me write on the board or anything like that. I'm going to try to talk really slow, repeat some things so you can write things down. And remember, you can always um, pause it and come back to it. You can uh, rewind it and things like that. All right, so here we go. Oh, and I'm going to keep it up like this. That way I can navigate the, the slides easier. <clears throat> well, maybe. There we go. Okay, so first thing. We're going to talk about the functions of muscles. There are three major functions of muscles, and we're going to talk about the first one, which is motion. This is one that we most often think of when we think of muscles. We think of motion. There's two parts to this motion. So think A and B. So A. A would be moving our body from place to place. That kind of motion. That kind of motion requires our skeletal muscles. Remember our skeletal muscles are attached to our bones. So when we contract our skeletal muscles, we pull on our bones and therefore pull on that body part and we're able to move that body part, therefore move our body. Second part to the motion is what we call peristalsis, the process of peristalsis. This is completed by way of our smooth muscle. So for example, our digestive tract is lined in smooth muscle. Now this little picture up here, I want you to kind of take a look up here while I talk too. And in the walls of the digestive tract, <clears throat> we find smooth muscle. The mere fact of something like food being in our digestive tract, what it does is it distends the walls of the digestive tract or it pushes on the walls. And that is the trigger that's going to get the smooth muscle to contract. So it distends the walls and gets it to contract. However, this contraction is in, in waves. It contracts in waves and waves in one direction, which helps to propel the food through the digestive tract. Kind of neat. And that's called peristalsis. Number two, stabilizing body position and joints. So you guys, we, we stand up, we walk around, we can sit up straight, and all of that is because of our muscles, our, mainly our skeletal muscles. Think of the erector muscles that you learned about in lab. It's a fine balance between contracting and relaxing of those muscles that allows for that body position. Around our joints, especially our movable joints, we're going to find those muscles that will help stabilize those joints and allow us to move. A third function of muscles is generation of heat. We don't often think of this one as being a function of muscles, but it is. Now, there is a more technical term for generation of heat in the body. And we call that thermogenesis. Thermogenesis. 
we have talked about this somewhat, especially in the beginning of class, beginning of uh, the semester, when we discussed homeostatic mechanisms. Look at our little guy down here shivering. So we learned that shivering is a physiological response and that shivering occurs by way of muscle contractions. Those muscle contractions, in order to get muscles to contract, <clears throat> we're going to release some heat. And that heat is going to be retained as our internal body temperature. Okay, and that's going to help regulate it, get it back within those normal limits helps us to generate heat. Now right over here, this little cartoon I have says caution goosebumps. I know, so silly. But goosebumps, we haven't talked about that. We all know what goosebumps are, the tiny little bumps that appear on our skin. But as it turns out, those goosebumps happen because of a muscle contraction. The name of the muscle is called the erector pili. You don't have to know that. Not for a lecture. Erector pili. So when they contract, what happens is that it pushes up part of the skin, part of that integumentary system right there. Well, if we think of it on a grand scale, all of those tiny, itty bitty erector pili muscles contracting, we are going to produce a little bit of heat. And we're going to retain that heat as part of our internal body temperature. All right, so that's the functions of muscles. Now, let's move on to characteristics. So characteristics of muscle tissue, there are four. We're going to start with the first one, which is excitability. So excitability, what does this mean? Excitability means that the muscle tissue is responsive. It's responsive to stimuli. Now my little picture over here, this pinkish structure is supposed to represent a muscle. This yellow is representing a motor neuron. So motor neurons will stimulate a muscle. They will excite a muscle and get that muscle to contract. Okay, the second one. Contractility. Contractility. It's a funny little name. Contractility. What this means is that the muscle has the ability to contract. Okay, well, yeah, yeah, we've all learned somewhere along the lines that we're not supposed to use the definition of the word in the definition, right? Something like that. All right, so what does contractility, what does, if, if it's the ability to contract, what does, what does contract mean? Contract means that, um, think of shortening. So, the ability to shorten. Now, muscle, and, and, and when we think of a muscle contracting, we most often think of our skeletal muscles contracting, and when they contract, they kind of get thicker and shorter in there. It's not really the muscle itself getting shorter. It's actually the proteins within the cells that are doing some more overlapping. And that is what the contracting is. We're going to talk lots more about that when we get into the processes. But contractility, the ability to contract or shorten. Okay, number three. Extensibility. To extend. To extend something means to make it longer. So extensibility of muscle tissue. This is going to mean that muscle cells or muscle tissue has the ability to stretch without being damaged. So stretch without being damaged. Of course up to a certain point. Um, and so we call that extensibility. The fourth one, elasticity. So elasticity, you think elastic. You think of an elastic rubber band. So what I want you to imagine is if I have a rubber band in my hand and I stretch it out, okay, this extends. So I'm going to stretch it out, but then I'm going to let go of it. What happens when I let go of it? 
it back it bounces back to its original shape I can do it over and over again it's always going to bounce back to its original shape that is because the the elastic nature of it so the elastic part of that means that it's going to bounce back to its original shape so let's look at this characteristics of muscle tissue elasticity muscle tissue has the ability to return to its original shape after being stretched and that's what elasticity means all right <clears throat> so now we are going to delve into the muscle cell now the muscle cell when scientists got really good at with microscopes and looking at tissues and they really started looking at all of the different types of cells and tissues they looked at a skeletal muscle cell and it looked way different than other types of cells in the body it was long and skinny and cylindrical and it looked like a fiber it's like a fiber that we find in the body and so they coined that name muscle fiber what we now know is it's a muscle cell and not so much a fiber well not a fiber it's a it's a cell however the name stuck so instead of calling it a muscle cell we always call it a muscle fiber so muscle fi muscle cells look way different than other types of cells in the body they're long and skinny skeletal muscles can be muscle fibers can be really long and as we go through the processes as we as I'm teaching all of this stuff to you I'm going to use a skeletal muscle as our muscle cell as our example so we're going to go over a little bit of anatomy probably more than what we usually do in lecture because you have to understand the anatomy of the muscle fiber in order to understand how that muscle fiber contracts and therefore how the entire muscle contracts so we're going to start talking about the uh, the anatomy of a muscle fiber so number one they are multinucleated so that means that they have more than one nucleus they have up to a hundred or even more nuclei per muscle fiber number two sarcolemma now what happens in anatomy sometimes well kind of all the time is that if an anatomical structure that has been named has some sort of modification in another area we give it a different name we name it differently that's what happened in this case of the sarcolemma so what the sarcolemma is is the plasma membrane of the muscle fiber now whenever you see sarco as this prefix s-a-r-c-o this tells you that it refers to a muscle fiber something that has to do with a muscle fiber the sarcolemma is the plasma membrane of the muscle fiber it has been modified and we're going to talk about that modification later on all right number three we're going to start talking about some of the organelles the first one is the mitochondria you guys know all about mitochondria what is the function of mitochondria did some of you say powerhouse of the cell uh, you might have everybody learns it as the powerhouse of the cell but now we can be more specific with it okay so let's not say that let's get more specific with the function of the mitochondria instead of saying powerhouse of the cell let's say it is the site of ATP synthesis that tells us exactly what goes on there now the mitochondria <clears throat> all of our cells have mitochondria the muscle fibers have more than their share of mitochondria they have quite a few mitochondria per cell now let's think again what is the function of the mitochondria 
hopefully you said, site of ATP synthesis. In order to get a muscle fiber to contract, we need a lot of ATP. And where we get the majority of our ATP is the mitochondria. Very good. So we have quite a few in each muscle fiber. Take a look at the picture over here. This shows a mu muscle fiber cut, okay? And what we see here is the sarcolemma, that plasma membrane cut and folded over, so we can see inside that cell. Notice the nuclei, nuclei. It's this little graphic is showing three, okay? It's representing that they have more than one, have multi multiple nuclei. Um, we open that up, we see the mitochondria, all right? Quite a few. The rest of the inside of that cell is taken up by all these little straw-like things. These straw-like things are what we call myofibrils. They're myofibrils. Here's one kind of teased out so you can see it. Now, myofibril is a type of organelle that is only found in muscle fibers. And more specifically, these myofibrils are found um, in this um, arrangement in skeletal muscles. And notice it takes up most of the inside of that cell. Now what happens is the more that we use that muscle, the more we use that muscle, the more myofibrils that we will add to that muscle fiber. So if you go to the gym, work out, lift a bunch of weights, start building up your muscles, making those bigger. If we took a look inside of your muscle fibers that are inside the muscle, you're going to be adding more of these myofibrils. Alternatively, if we did not use our muscle, if let's say we were paralyzed for some reason, or we were, uh, we got put in a cast and you couldn't use that muscle, we're going to reduce the amount of myofibrils that's in each of your muscle fibers. Therefore, that muscle would shrink, called atrophy. So we can add or reduce the number of myofibrils. Now, myofibrils. On these myofibrils, within the myofibril, I should say, we find what are called sarcomeres sarcomere. There's that prefix again, sarco. Sarco refers to the inside of a muscle fiber. So what is a sarcomere? So write, be sure you're writing this down. A sarcomere is a functional unit of a muscle fiber. Now, you're going to hear me say that a few times with an AMP1 and 2, functional unit. So what is a functional unit? A functional unit is something that is, is an anatomical unit that has everything inside of it that allows for the function of that anatomical part. So a sarcomere, since it is the functional unit of the muscle fiber, it has everything in within that sarcomere in order to get that muscle to contract. Now what is this everything? More specifically, there are very important proteins inside the sarcomere, or that make up the sarcomere, that get that muscle to contract. The proteins we call contractile proteins, which we will talk about later. So if we're looking at this myofibril, we may have a sarcomere here. Check out that little uh, star thing for right here. There might be a sarcomere here, another sarcomere, another sarcomere, another sarcomere, another sarcomere. So it's one after another on these myofibrils. Okay, another organelle, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That reminds you of the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, you learned what an endoplasmic reticulum was in lab. 
and I'm sure you know the function of the endoplasmic reticulum. Remember I said when we when when anatopical structures get modified, we like to change their name. In this case, the endoplasmic reticulum of the muscle fiber has been modified. So we call it the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now the sarcoplasmic reticulum, its major function is calcium release. Alright, so it's going to store and release calcium. That's its modification. Now we're going to talk about some of the proteins associated with muscle fibers. We are going to talk about all of them, but just some of them. Now if you're reading your textbook, and you probably read about quite a few different types of proteins in the muscle fiber that work together to get that muscle to contract. We, in our class, is not going to talk about, we are not going to talk about all of those. We're going to talk about some of those. The ones that I think you need to understand in order to understand how that muscle contracts. So the first one, we are going to talk about myosin. So myosin, the myosin molecule, is this right up here at the top. The myosin molecule has a tail and it's a, it's a filamentous tail and two globular heads. So that is what the molecule looks like. A filamentous tail and two globular heads. However, the myosin molecule in skeletal muscle does not like to hang out by itself. It likes to hang out with its friends. And so what does it usually look like in a skeletal muscle fiber? It looks like this, the bottom one. And we call that a filament. So about 200 myosin molecules make up one filament. And because it's so thick, so big, we call it the thick filament. So myosin made up of the makes up the thick filament in a skeletal muscle. Now something else to note about the myosin molecule. It has two pivot points. It can actually change its shape a little bit and it has two pivot points. One pivot point is going to be about right here on the tail. The other pivot point is going to be right up here underneath the globular head. It's kind of like the neck area, I guess you could say. Alright, and we'll talk more about that when we get into the, con the uh, contracting. Alright, okay, another type of protein is called actin. Now actin, if you look over here, I want you to look at the top picture. This is showing an, a filament. <clears throat> Now, these little purple kind of egg shaped looking structures, if I just take one of those purple structures out, that would be one actin molecule. So, as we find actin, similar to the myosin, we don't just find one actin molecule in skeletal muscles, we find them hanging out with their friends. So, many together. I don't know if you can see from this picture, but there's a darker area on that actin molecule. That darker area is, is an active site on that molecule. That might remind you of enzymes. We talked about active sites on enzymes. This is a place where a binding can occur, okay, where binding occurs. Now, this actin filament. The actin filament is, um, it has two regulatory, pro regulatory proteins associated with it. Those two regulatory proteins are tropomyosin and troponin. So first the tropomyosin. Tropomyosin is a long filamentous protein, and you can see it here, it's kind of the orangish colored one. and when a muscle is relaxed, 
the tropomyosin covers up the active sites on the actin. So that's why you can't really see this very well. It's covered it up, those active sites. The troponin. The troponin here is shown in kind of these yellow circles. The troponin is actually attached to the tropomyosin. Both of these, tropomyosin and troponin, are regulatory proteins associated with the actin filament. We call it a filament because it's made up of many actin proteins. Now, the, tropo, the troponin is attached to the tropomyosin. Now, you can see from the picture down here, this shows the actin filament, and it's much smaller than the myosin filament. So we call it the thin filament. This is called the thin filament. So we have a thin filament, which is made up of actin, and then we have the thick filament, which is made up of myosin. Now, if we look, remember I talked about a sarcomere, the sarcomere being the functional unit, and located one after another on those myofibrils. If we looked inside of that myofibril, this is what we'd see. Okay, we'd see them stacked like this. The thin filaments over the thick filament, then another thin filament over the thick filament, one after the other. This represents a sarcomere. <clears throat> Okay, a few other com important components of muscle tissue. One is called myoglobin. Myoglobin. Now, myoglobin is a molecule that is found inside muscle fibers, and it's very interesting. Now, when I say myo, whenever you see MYO, that tells us it's muscle, myoglobin. Now, myoglobin is a special molecule that will bind oxygen. Okay, it binds oxygen. It will bind two molecules of oxygen. Um, it is similar to, think of it kind of like a cousin to hemoglobin. So where do we find hemoglobin? Yep, we find hemoglobin in the blood. And if we think about what does hemoglobin do, we know that hemoglobin helps deliver the oxygen throughout our body. So when we breathe in, the oxygen goes from our lungs into the blood. The blood, it attaches to the hemoglobin molecule. The oxygen attaches. Now, we, we understand that. Now let's track that oxygen mo molecule. We know the oxygen is on its way to the tissues. And within those tissue cells, it goes to the mitochondria. We know we have to have that oxygen in the mitochondria in order for the oxygen to be the terminal electron acceptor. Very good. And that allows for us to make tons of ATP. So in order to make tons of ATP, we have to have that oxygen in the mitochondria. In order for muscles to contract, we need a lot of ATP. Now, this is a molecule found inside the muscle fiber. Think of it kind of floating around in there. And whenever oxygen is there inside the cell, it will bind to the oxygen. So this is an extra molecule inside that cell that will help to bind oxygen. It kind of it's kind of a storage room for oxygen. Think of it that way. But well, that's kind of cool. So yeah, muscles need a lot of oxygen, right? They need it in the mitochondria. And now we have these extra storage rooms inside the muscle fiber called myoglobin that will attach that oxygen. Right? Keep it from leaving and going someplace else. It's going to attach that oxygen. Keep it kind of like keeping it in storage until we need it. 
Now why do I have this picture of this meat up here? And let me see if I can blow this up so you can actually see it maybe. Now here we have some fish, we have some chicken, and we have some maybe beef right over here, I'm guessing. And um, now what ha I have a spectrum here from no myoglobin, let more, 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 to lots of myoglobin. And what's the biggest thing we see in the, in the colors? Well, it looks like the more myoglobin that we have, the darker the meat, right? Now, myoglobin is a pigment. It is a type of pigment, just like hemoglobin is. Hemoglobin is a pigment, myoglobin is a pigment. It just happens to bind oxygen. The more myoglobin that you have, the darker the meat, okay? So fish don't have a whole lot of myoglobin there, right? Chicken have some, but not a whole lot. Beef, right here, beef, lots of myoglobin. Contributes to the darker color. Okay, we may talk about that a little bit later. All right, but that's a pretty pretty cool molecule to have right inside of a muscle fiber, especially if you know how muscle fiber works. All right, another uh, component or the structure that we're going to talk about is called the transverse tubule or the T-tubules. Now, let me take you back to the sarcolemma. Now, we talked about the sarcolemma, oh, back here talked about the sarcolemma. What did you have written down for the sarcolemma? It was the plasma membrane of the muscle fiber that was highly modified. Okay, now we're going to talk about that modification. It's back over here. That modification is these T-tubules. So the T-tubules of the sarcolemma are infoldings of the sarcolemma. So infoldings, that is the modification. This is way different. Let's look at this picture. I'm going to try to blow it. That's not working. Try to hit it right there. <clears throat> there we go. Oh, I kind of messed that up. That's okay. All right, so we're looking at this sarcolemma, which is represented by the sarcolemma. It's this pink thing down here. Now, the T-tubules, the modification is an infolding. So here we have the, the plasma membrane, and this is an infolding of the plasma membrane. Kind of think of it like it as an invagination of the sarcolemma. So here's the sarcolemma, and now it invaginates to the inside of that cell. So what's represented here in yellow is that T-tubule. That means um, a slight portion of the sarcolemma infiltrates into the inside of that muscle fiber. And in looking at the picture, it comes into contact with each and every myofibril. Okay. Now, so what is the T-tubule? It is the T-tubule of the sarcolemma. It's an infolding. It's a portion of the muscle fiber that enfolds to the inside of the cell, inside of the muscle fiber. So that's the structure part of it. What is the function? The function of a T-tubule is to deliver impulses deep within the muscle fiber. So to do, help deliver the impulses deep within the muscle fiber. <clears throat> All right, I think I messed this up a little bit. When I try to change the shape, there we go. I just want you to see this word triad. This is a term that you're going to hear me say when we talk about the physiology of a muscle contraction called a triad. So I want you to know what a triad is, what a triad represents as far as the anatomical structure. 
try means three. You guys know that. So we're looking for three things, three structures. So what is a triad? A triad is made up of one part T-tubule. So if you see my cursor, I'm running it along that yellow part. That's the T-tubule. Remember the T-tubules run deep into the muscle fiber and around each of the myofibrils. This is a T-tubule. And on either side, or on both sides I should say, we find this blue thing. Now what is this blue thing? This blue thing is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. We'd already talked about what a sarcoplasmic reticulum is. You wrote that down. And this is a modified endoplasmic reticulum. The function of the sarcoplasmic reticulum is to store and release calcium ions for the muscle. Now, the, what it looks like, this blue thing, kind of looks like a web. And, and notice it's, it's, it's surrounding each of these myofibrils. Notice that over here. What this reminds me of, and it's kind of fitting because we just had Halloween, but you know that you can buy a bag of floss, like a, the webbing, spider web. And when you go to put it on something, you can put that stuff on anything. So you take it and you spread it out and you, 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 you pull on it and you spread it out and you can, you can, it covers a big area. We pull, and if we wanted to stick to something, right, if you want to put it over our wall, you can do that. If you want to put it over a table and chairs, you can do that. And all you have to do is kind of drape it over and pull. You guys know what I mean. So imagine, imagine that. And if I was inside of a muscle fiber, and I take it, and I, and I stretch it out, and I drape it over each of these myofibrils, okay, that would be like the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's pulled and draped, and sometimes in certain areas it's thicker, some areas it's thinner, just, just like it shows on that picture. It's that webbing that, that drapes over everything. That is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. In a muscle fiber, the function is to store and release calcium when prompted. Okay, you'll learn lots more about that later. However, when we're talking a triad, I said it's one part, the T-tubule, and on both sides we find this thicker portion of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So a triad, one, two, three, is made up of one part T-tubule and two parts sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay. So I think that you guys know all the anatomy that you need to know in order to get that muscle to contract. So our next lecture, I will work on going through the process of getting that muscle to contract. In our next lecture, we're going to, I'm going to start with the neuromuscular junction. We're going to learn a little bit about the neuromuscular junction how the nerve will stimulate the muscle fiber in order to get that muscle fiber to contract. Okay, so that's where we will start on the next lecture. We're going to start with the neuromuscular junction and work our way till we get that muscle to contract. So as of now, we are done.